Hello everyone, this is Dr. Jenkins and welcome to your first video. So you're not going to see me, but you can see the same PowerPoint that I would be using if we were in class in person. And just like I would be in class in person, uh, I'll write on the things that are most important. And it is kind of like being in class, but probably in your sweatpants or PJs, which is fine. So what I want to do for this first video is I want to finish the intro, which there really isn't much more to it. And then I want to get through a big chunk of the terminology and human motion chapter. Okay? All right. So we ended off when we met in lecture this past Thursday for the first time. We ended off talking about qualitative versus, excuse me, versus quantitative. We can remember that quantitative, I think about the N, quantitative assessments involve some sort of numerical value. Some kind of numerical assigning of things, objective measures. Qualitative was more about description of motion without being numerical. I want to make sure that you understand that qualitative doesn't necessarily mean that it's more general. So in some ways, qualitative can be just as specific as quantitative. So sometimes there's this thought that qualitative is always going to be simpler, and sometimes it is. Sometimes if you're describing form, you tend to use simpler terminology, but it doesn't always have to be as simple. So it can be just as specific as the quantitative if you want it to be. So they both have a lot of value. Okay. I have some slides here to give you many, many opportunities to practice. So please, please, please practice. Be able to describe or list, excuse me, be able to list some qualitative things you could assess and quantitative things you could assess. And I also want to make the point that it doesn't necessarily have to be a sport thing. Sometimes it could be an everyday thing like ergonomics. If someone's sitting at a desk all day, can it be helpful to have them seated in a certain posture, the things positioned certain ways to lessen the stress on their joints and, and their body? So it doesn't have to be sports, okay? At the very end of this, just a couple of things to wrap up here. I want to make sure that we mention the scientific method. I know you've already had it already, but this is the only way to objectively assess something in science. So just remember that. Usually the steps of the scientific method are something like observation, and then from an observation you create a hypothesis. You create a hypothesis, and then you generate a testing method that's reproducible, that's non-biased, all those sorts of things. Testing methodology, and then you run the test. Oftentimes you have a control group and an experimental group. Sometimes you may have a placebo controlled, and then you analyze results, and you come to a conclusion. Oftentimes your starting point for that conclusion is you go back to your hypothesis and you can objectively say, did our results show the hypothesis to be true, yes or no? That's the first question you ask and then after that, you can create theory or come to more conclusions based on your results. I'm not super worried about this, so you don't have to be able to, lay, to list all the steps of the scientific method, but I just want to remind you, you know, I'll be presenting some data, I'll be presenting some stuff, and within the field of science, which kinesiology is, in order to be considered a legitimate study, you've got to follow certain steps, the steps of the scientific method. On your notes, you can see I put the scientific method, so just know what it is. You don't need to know the steps, but just know that it's the only legitimate way to test something within science. There's different ways that you can do a scientific method test. You can do an observational study 
you know all this. You can do an observational study, or you can do a, an experimental study. The experimental studies are going to have a control group and an experimental group. It might be in a lab. It might be in the field. How might we utilize this in the fields of kinesiology? Well, you can see them in your notes. Okay, this is more general, but I feel like it's important to just mention the scientific method. We can analyze form using just simple observation. We can analyze form using a goniometer to measure range of motion. We can analyze form using a sophisticated computer program. So it really runs the gamut. When we talk about new equipment, we have to run a scientific method tests to make sure that that new equipment is reliable and accurate. So there's all sorts of ways that we can use it in kinesiology. You can see also in your notes, everyday observations. So sometimes we don't always have to do a scientific method to gather some important data. You know, we meet for lab once a week for two hours. That's not enough time to create, conduct, analyze using a scientific method. So sometimes we're gonna begin with just some observation. It's the first step of the scientific method, but that's how we'll be using it in lab most likely. We will be utilizing some tools, check out your notes. Okay. And then to the end of this one, I just wanted to give you some examples of kinesiology and biomechanics in real life. You don't need to know these for a test, but there's all sorts of applications to kinesiology, not just studying the body in a motion or a sport, but also it can be equipment. So we think about the advances that have happened in a sport like golf. And I give you some information here, just FYI. We think about bicycles. Uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned this the first day, but I do a lot of cycling. And there's been a big change in bicycles. I could talk all day about that. Look at these pictures on the left of the Tour de France. They used to smoke because they thought it would open up their lungs for more and actually improve their performance. How about them apples? Being a cyclist, I could talk about the positioning of different bikes. So a time trial bike on the right versus a regular road bike on the left. These are just examples. You don't need to know them, but we can also have, we can also have advances in equipment. Okay? All right. So what I want to do is, is I really want to get into our second chapter, which is terminology and motion. Okay, so let's get going on this one. Excellent. All right. Now, a lot of this chapter, my friends, is going to be a review. If, if you were seeing me in person, you can bet I'd be smiling because I would want to know that you remember some things from anatomy and physiology and other classes. Ha, 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 ha. Let's first talk about terminology. This is something that maybe you do remember a lot. Anterior, posterior, superior, inferior, flexion, extension, prone, supine, all those things. Maybe you remember them and this will not be, this will not require much study. But if you don't remember them, you are going to have to study them. It is my expectation that you know these terms, folks. You know them just like another language, right? So identify where you're at and then take the appropriate steps. Okay. You can see on your notes there, Roman numeral number one are, are directional terms. When we talk about directional terms, superior, inferior, medial, lateral, proximal, distal, etc. Everything is referenced from anatomical position, right, of course. This is important because we wanna make sure we're all talking about the same thing. The important thing with anatomical position is to remember that the forearms and the palms are facing front. So the front of the body, anatomical position, the forearms, uh, the palms are facing forward. So we always reference our terminology from this assumed position. I am not going to necessarily go over everything for you because you can review on your own. This is our common language. This is where it all starts. For example, anterior. Doesn't anterior mean front? Do I have that on the front back? 
Let's see. You remember anterior. Anterior means front. So the anterior aspect of the elbow is this part of the elbow. The anterior aspect of the knee is this part of the knee. Whereas posterior means back, right? So I would have to look at the back of this person to identify their posterior side. Medial lateral, medial means closer to the midline, medial. Lateral means further away from the midline. Superior means more towards the head. Inferior means more towards the feet. Proximal and distal, these sometimes can be tough. Proximal and distal tend to relate to the appendages. So when we're talking about the arms and the legs, that's when we usually use proximal and distal. Proximal means closer to the attachment. Closer to attachment or origin. And when we say attachment or origin, we mean where that limb attaches to the body. Distal means further away from attachment. Okay, this is definitely a review. Make sure you know these terms. Prone means lying on your belly. Supine means lying on your back. Superficial means superficial towards the surface. Deep means deep. For superficial and deep, I think about burn. So superficial burn is more on the surface of the skin. A deep burn is deeper, more towards the core of the body. I'm going quickly because it should be a review and make sure that you know them, okay? We also have specific terminology for movement, right? We don't just say bend at the knee or pull the elbow out. We have specific terms. Hopefully I don't need to remind you the importance of these, but I will anyway. The importance of these is to have, a, is to have a common language, right? We need to have a common language so that when we're talking to each other as healthcare providers or as kinesiologists or phys ed teachers or whatever, that everyone knows what everyone means. So make sure you review these movement terms. Flexion is to make a joint angle narrow Usually, flexion means to bend. So if you flex at your elbow, you're bending it. The more specific definition is to narrow a joint angle. The shoulder is not the best example of this. You should know what shoulder flexion is. Shoulder flexion is bringing your shoulder forward. A better specific example would be the elbow. So, you know, if I have somebody really bad drawing okay Oops, I did it on its own check that out but if we have somebody right that would be a flexed elbow where the joint angle is smaller it's narrowed to extend is to increase or widen a joint angle right so extension of the elbow would look like this, right? Extended straight, usually it means straight or extended, yeah. Okay, we're gonna have an opportunity to practice with this in lab, but I absolutely need you to study this on your own so that when you come in, you're ready to roll. Abduction, these two sound very familiar. Ab with a B as in baby. Abduction means to move away from the midline away from the midline, the midline meaning like the belly button, right, the center of the body. Adduction means to move towards the midline, right? Abduction away from the midline, adduction towards the midline. Not every joint can do all of these. The hip, the shoulder, the fingers, they can abduct and adduct. The elbow cannot. The elbow can only flex and extend, all right? Sometimes we can have lateral flexion, we'll discuss that more. We have medial or internal rotation, which is to rotate towards the midline. And we have lateral or external rotation, which is to rotate away from the midline. Circumduction is putting them all together. Circumduction is putting them all together. Imagine a third base coach in baseball or softball 
giving the sim giving the signal for a runner to round third and go home, so making like a windmill motion. Circumduction is including all of those. And then we have some joint specific terms um, of sp particular note. Let's look at horizontal adduction and abduction. This can occur at the shoulder. I think of these as like a seal. You know how a seal can go like, ur, ur, ur. so putting your arms straight out in front of you and then you can bring your, you can horizontally adduct, bring them towards you. Think of like a, oops, oh, just dropped my head, excuse me. Think of like a pec fly exercise when you bring your arms in towards you, that's pec fly, that would be horizontal adduction. When you bring them away, it's ab, horizontal abduction. The scapula, the scapula has specific motions. We can elevate it like a shoulder shrug, we can depress. We can protract, which is to bring the scapula forward anteriorly, and we can scapular retract, bring it back. If you look at the ankle, the ankle can dorsiflex, which means to flex your toe up. Our ankle can do plantar flexion, plant your toe down. We can invert, bring your toe in towards your midline, and we can evert, bring your toe out towards the midline. Practice, practice, practice. The reason I'm going quickly also is because you're gonna, you're gonna master these best by practicing it yourself. I can sit here and say to I'm going face that plantar flexion is a point the toe down. Plantar flexion, point the toe down. Plantar flexion, point the toe down. But then I'll just be blue in the face and you'll be annoyed more than you already are. So, but the best way to do this is practice. So we're gonna have time in lab. Practice, practice, practice. The forearm can do pronation and supination. Pronation is to twist the forearm into a palms down. Pronation is to twist the forearm to a palms down. Supination is to twist the forearm so it's palms up. At the wrist, we can do radial and ulnar deviation. Ulnar deviation is to move the wrist more towards the pinky or ulna. Radial deviation is to move it more towards the thumb. So see how on the right here, it's moving more towards the thumb. Here, it's moving more towards the pinky. Circumduction, like I said, is putting them all together to make a windmill type motion. Review, review, review. Also review the planes of the body. These would be imaginary planes. We have an imaginary plane that divides the body into right and left halves. That is the sagittal plane. So the sagittal plane is an imaginary plane that divides the body into right and left halves. This I know is a review, folks, sagittal. So let's see, if I was gonna draw it on here, this little pane right here is showing you the sagittal plane, divides into a right and a left. Okay. The frontal plane, folks, you don't really need to think too much about that, I don't think, because the frontal plane, as the name suggests, divides the body into front and back halves. Frontal plane. So if I was gonna outline the frontal plane, it would be this one. Divides the body into a front and a back half. And then lastly, we have the transverse plane. And the transverse plane divides us into top and bottom halves. So that would be, I'll put it in purple. This is the transverse plane. You know, I have a colleague um, at Hudson Valley Community College and she uses some pretty interesting examples for this one. So I am not usually a violent person, but I do find that her examples kind of get the point across. 
sometimes, uh, and I'm not, I'm not going to ask this question, but she asks it, and it might help you understand this. One of, uh, one of her, my colleagues' questions would be, if someone is decapitated, what plane of motion did that decapitation occur in? <laughs> when I first found out about it, I said, Dr. Mastrangelo, you are so violent. But upon thinking about it, it kind of makes sense because a decapitation means to cut someone's head off. Not that we would do that. But to cut someone's head off, you would have to make a motion in that plane, wouldn't you? What plane of motion is a decapitation? Transverse. It's a way of dividing the body into top and bottom halves. And then, as if her violence wasn't enough, then she asks, what if um, someone had their ear sliced off? Who's that artist that had his ear? I'm not good with art, clearly. If you slice your ear off, you know, you would slice it off kind of this way. So if you slice your ear off, that is in the sagittal plane. I don't know. I'm not sure if these are helpful to you, but <laughs> make sure you review the planes of the body. Okay. You'll notice that in your notes, I'm also asking you to know which axis these motions occur along. So not only do you need to know by definition the planes of the body, but what axis is associated with each plane. So with, and it's written in your notes, right? The sagittal plane, is a plane around the medial-lateral axis. This may just be memorization, okay? The frontal plane is around the antero-posterior axis. And the transverse plane is around the longitudinal axis. This is just memorization, folks. You can do it, put the time towards it. The last piece to add, and once again, we're going to be able to practice this in the lab. What that means is, the better you study before coming to lab, the more you're going to get out of the lab. And I'll talk more about this when we meet for lab the first time. You know, we have a big lab project at the end, and basically in that final lab project, you're going to be doing a complete analysis of emotion, and the labs that I have you do this semester are helping you practice for what you have to do in that final project anyway. So, you can really help yourself out by studying before you come to lab. This is a prime example of that. Memorize these planes and axes and motions, and then you're gonna get much more out of the lab when we practice. All right, I gave you my piece. So on your notes there, what joint motions occur in each plane? This might be a little bit more theoretical, but I'm gonna try and explain it as best as I can. In general, when we think about the sagittal plane, the motions of flexion and extension occur in the sagittal plane. Think about shoulder flexion and extension. Shoulder flexion is to bring your arm forward. And I don't mean to be morose here, but it's kind of like a, a Heil Hitler thing. Right? Just because I know you probably know what that means. So bringing your, raising your arm forward, that's shoulder flexion. And then shoulder extension is moving your arm back behind you. The way to think about this might be flexion and extension. If I, if you stand up right now, if you stand up right now and you do shoulder flexion and extension, you're moving your arm in front of you and then backward, shoulder flexion and extension. That motion is parallel to the sagittal plane. The sagittal plane divides us into right and left halves and flexion and extension is moving parallel to that imaginary plane. 
feel free to stop the video, make notes, think about it, rewind a little bit, watch it again, listen again. We will be practicing this in lab. Okay. And then, likewise, we have abduction and adduction that are occurring in the frontal plane. If I abduct and adduct, it's like a, a chicken wing motion, bring my shoulders out and then back in towards my body. Those motions are parallel to the frontal plane. And then lastly, transverse, what motions occur in this plane? Rotation, internal rotation, external rotation, that sort of thing. Once you know these, you can answer the last question. What are some examples of activities that happen in each plane? If I think about the sagittal plane, an example of a sagittal plane activity is running in a straight line. If I'm running in a straight line and I'm pumping my arms and legs, it's mostly flexion and extension, running in a straight line. Think about a softball pitcher. That windmill motion is, of course there's some abduction, but it's mostly flexion and extension. Versus frontal. What motion is occurring mostly in the frontal plane? What about a jumping jack? Abduction and adduction at the shoulder and the hip. A jumping jack. Doing a cartwheel. These are examples of things that happen in the frontal plane. What is an example of an activity that happens primarily in the transverse plane? Think about an ice hockey player shooting on goal. Don't they have to twist? They've got to cock their shoulder back to generate momentum and then come through when they twist as they shoot. Think about a figure skater spinning on an axis. Rotation. Be able to give an example of each. You can see Letter, letter D there, multi-directional movements. Of course, folks, it's rare that a human motion is uniplanar. That's a weird word, isn't it? Might be a unitard, which is not really a pleasant sight to me. But uniplanar, uni means one. So this would be, this would be defined as a motion happening mostly in one plane. So, you know, we could argue running in a straight line is mostly in the sagittal plane. But if we're talking about real life athletics and activities, how often do we run in a dead straight line? Rarely, if ever. So indeed, most everyday motions, most sporting motions are multi-planar or multi-directional. We have motions happening in all three planes. So be able to give an example of an activity that happens primarily in one plane, but also have the understanding that a lot of our sporting motions, a lot of our everyday motions are multi-planar. We're moving limbs and the body in all sorts of planes. All right. All right, now to some things that might be a little bit newer to you, maybe. So we've already begun to list some ways to describe motion. Let me, let me make a, let's see if I can do this, if you'll bear with me for a moment. What are ways in which we can describe motion? We've already, talked about describing motion as either qualitative or quantitative, right? One bullet point. So one way that we've already talked about ways of describing motion was we could describe emotion in terms that are qualitative or quantitative. Right? Well, now we're going to add some other ways. And a lot of times there's some overlap between these. 
So as you're studying, I would suggest that you learn them individually first. You know, we've already talked about qualitative versus quantitative, correct? Right, so qualitative was describing motion, form, description. Quantitative was using numbers to more objectively quantify, describe motion. Now we're gonna introduce another way to describe motion, and that would be forms of motion being linear or angular. Sometimes we can combine these. We can have a quantitative assessment that's linear, or we can have a quantitative assessment that's angular. So they can be combined, but I would first recommend studying them individually, okay? So let's address linear and angular. Okay, I'm going to be pretty specific. Let's see, do I have what do I have here? Okay, well, let me go back to this first. So here's how I would suggest you learn these. And I think you probably already have a pretty good idea. But I, wanna, I want you to be sure that you're specific. A linear form of motion. A linear form of motion is motion in one direction at one speed. A true linear form of motion is motion in one direction at one speed. linear motion, motion in one direction at one speed. Within linear, within linear, we could have rectilinear or curve linear. Rectilinear would be a straight line, straight line. Curvilinear, as the name suggests, would be a curved line. Okay, so to start with, linear, motion in one direction at one speed. Let's go back over here. So forms of motion. So let's talk about linear. A linear form of motion is described as movement in one direction at one speed. Think about a gymnast spinning around the uneven bars or parallel bars, right? So this gymnast might be going like this. Well, actually that would be curvilinear. Hold on. If she's not spinning, but if she's just going this way and that way, her body is moving in one direction at one speed. What if, what about when she dismounts? When she dismounts, instead of it being more of a rectilinear straight line, it's a curvilinear. It's still direct, it's still movement in one direction at one speed, but it's a curved motion. Rotation is also a curved motion. Now, I don't want you to get caught up in semantics. If we were, if we were to actually measure her speed, well, if she's, let's give this example up here, right, rectilinear. If she's moving in this way and then that way, it's probably not the same exact speed, right? Maybe it's, I don't know, one meter per second in this direction, but 1.2 meters per second in that direction. 
So technically, if we were to actually measure, it's probably unlikely that a person, because we're human, is at the same exact speed. However, it's a steady speed, right? It's pretty steady. It's not start and stop. Another thing that's important about linear motion is that more or less, all parts of the body move together as a unit. That's another way of how the definition of movement in one direction at one speed plays out. All parts of the body are moving together as a unit, more or less, okay? That's why I like the gymnast example. You know, this is different from a baseball pitcher, right? A baseball pitcher, <laughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, a baseball pitcher, isn't the shoulder moving at a different speed as the elbow? The elbow might be kind of having some torque or rotation where the shoulder isn't at a certain motion. So this is different from a football quarterback throw where they cock back and then there's kind of a, sl a slowing in speed and then they accelerate to throw the ball. Those are not linear because some parts of the body are moving at different speeds or relative to other parts of the body. In a true linear motion, more or less, all parts of the body are moving together as a unit. I'm gonna blow my nose, I really apologize. Okay. Not only can we describe